Hi, this is Roger Peterson, and join me on this drive to the town of Grecia in the Central Valley area. This area is becoming very popular with both expats and Costa Ricans due to the great climate, reasonable prices for real estate, and cost of living. Now, there's a new project currently underway, which is expanding the existing highway to eight lanes. This is going to result in a quick commute from San Jose to this area of the Central Valley. This project known as Ruta Uno is already underway and here's a rendering so you can get an idea of what the project uh, will look like when it is completed. Now as a result of all this new road infrastructure, we're also seeing the construction of a new free trade zone and technology park called Costa Rica Green Valley that is being built here and that's going to attract companies and hopefully generate more employment in this area. Next, we're going to head up from Grecia Center to El Cajon de Grecia, which is a small town up in the hills, about 15, 20 minutes away. And there we're going to meet with Brooke Bishop, who is a 22-year resident of the Central Valley and who now lives in Grecia. Okay, Brooke, uh, Grecia is definitely a very mountainous uh, area. A lot of, I see a lot of ridges, a lot of mountainous areas. Can you get, can tell us a feel for what, you know, what's out there? What, where are the, what are the most popular places that people want to mm -hmm. live? Yes, um, Gracia has five ridges. Uh, starting from the east, it's uh, San Isidro, and then Carbonal, San Miguel, El Cajon, which is where we are today. And then the last ridge to the west is San Luis, which is also the highest ridge. A lot of my clients like to be on the ridges because you're 15 or 20 minutes by car to downtown Gracia. Um, it's a little bit cooler, it's more private, you get the pretty views up here, and um, there are still, even though we're 15 or 20 minutes from town, there's hourly bus service, and there's lots of little pulperias or mini marts that you can still pick things up at. Hey, Brooke, I'm also seeing a lot of uh, movement in the areas around Grecia as well, because I see that's growing as well, like Naranjo, San Ramon, what, you know, what's your experience in those areas? Um, yes, it's true. Uh, Gracia started off as being the, the main place that most people were looking, but now it's expanding. And actually, I have quite a few sales in Sarchi now. Um, Sarchi is probably about the second, second or third most popular area. Naranjo is um, getting off the ground as well. And of course, San Ramon. Lots of people like to be in San Ramon, which is about the same size as Gracia. Sarchi, Naranjo, and Gracia have very similar altitude or climates. It depends on the altitude. All of the towns are at about 1,300 meters. So as you go up the mountains, then the altitude gets cooler. And there's palmares in between Naranjo and San Ramon, um, but there's very rarely anything for sale in palmares. I had asked Brooke to show us a typical property listing that she has in that area. And she showed us this property, which is being sold uh, by an expat that has to return to the U.S. due to family reasons. The listing price on the property she showed us was at $289,000. I'll give you a quick walk around so you can get an idea of what you get for this price range in the Grecia area. Then after that, stay tuned because we're going to do a more extensive sit-down uh, interview with Brooke where we're going to discuss cost of living, real estate prices, health care, and activities in the Grecia area. Okay, so we start out basically to say, hello, Brooke, how are you doing? We're here today with Brooke Bishop. Brooke is uh, uh, from the United States originally, and she lives in Grecia, and she's been kind enough to spend uh, some time to us today explaining us a little bit about her backyard, Grecia. And uh, Brooke, how did you end up in Costa Rica? How did you end up in Grecia? Um, well, I came about 22 years ago as a volunteer, and I originally came to Sarchi, which is right next to Grecia. And I ended up settling in Naranjo, which is on the other side of Sarchi. So when I started doing real estate, um, my, the idea was that I would work Gracia, Sarchi, and Naranjo, which I do, but mostly Gracia still from the beginning and still because it seems to have more of the caliber homes that a lot of my clients are looking for. You're like right in the middle of what's right now becoming, in my opinion, one of the most popular uh, expat destinations in, in, in Costa Rica and the Central Valley. Uh, what do you yeah. think that, that uh, you know, that surge in interest in the area? Well, part of its location, because, um, you know, Gracie is a half an hour from the airport. Most of the places are only a half an hour to 45 minutes uh, from the international airport, um, about an hour to San Jose. And the towns are um, smallish, uh, medium to small. 
and um, pretty much just coffee towns. So I think because they have the amenities that people are looking for, um, but they're not uh, big bustling cities, and yet they're close enough to the cities. I think those are some of the things that, that have made this area popular. The climate is wonderful. Um, we're looking at uh, mid 70s to mid 80s, depending on your altitude in these areas. Um, the climate's just pretty much perfect. And, and, and with that, and with that backdrop, uh, what's what's like a typical, let's say, a typical three bedroom, two bath house in 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 that area? What's the typical cost? And then we'll go through what you know what the utilities and property taxes are. But what what is your like the average uh, sale price so people get an idea of what they can buy in that area? Um, well, the prices are all over the place, really. Uh, the amount of land has a lot to do with it, but most of my clients, you know, at least a quarter acre of land is what they're looking for up to an acre. Um, that's pretty much standard. You're looking at two to 250,000 for a house like that. You know, part of what I like about Costa Rica is being in that outdoor lifestyle and being able to plant and grow. So like in your area, what's the typical, I mean, can I grow fruit trees? Uh, okay. Can I grow herbs, vegetables? I mean, what, what, what do you guys do out there? Everything. Uh, you can pretty much grow everything. They say here, if you stick it in the ground, it grows. Um, we've got really good, rich volcanic soil. Um, we've got the perfect temperatures, uh, just enough rain, just enough sunshine that things, everybody has a green thumb in Costa Rica, and this, especially in this part of Costa Rica. Most people have mango trees, avocado trees, orange trees, uh, lemon and lime trees. We have papayas. You can grow pineapples, um, peaches. There's, you know, pretty much anything that doesn't need a hard frost, you can grow here. Many of my clients have gardens with tomatoes and um, zucchinis, peppers, onions. <laughs> you can grow anything here. I, yeah, I find that I find that to be one of the most appealing parts about living in Costa Rica is exactly that the ability to be, you can basically without really having like you say everybody has a green thumb because it rains and the soil is great um, and you can really sustain yourself uh, pretty much in Costa Rica without a lot of effort. I mean, it's pretty hard to starve <laughs> in Costa Rica. It really is. <laughs> It really is because your neighbors always have fruits too. And, you know, during mango season, you go somewhere and you have to take mangoes. If people have mango trees, they're kind of like zucchinis in the United States, you know, and when those are in season, you go to somebody's house and everybody uh, makes you leave with a certain amount of mangoes. So most days when I go out and I have listings or I have clients, I would say at least several times a week, I come home with the other day I came home with three avocados and four tangerines that I got from two different places that people just gave me. So, you know, it's really, it's fun. People are very generous with the fruit too, because there's so much of it. Yes. That's what I, that's what I find. There is such a culture of sharing the agricultural products in Costa Rica because we're such a agricultural based society from way back. And so it's like entrenched in the local culture. So it, it is, and that's why there's so, also so many farmers markets. So for example, in your area, what days are the farmer's market? What market do you go to for like produce? Is there something in Grecia, Naranjo? What, what, where do people go on the weekends for, for farmer's markets, let's say? Well, Grecia is my favorite market. Um, and it is Friday from around noon to I think 8.30 at night. Mm -hmm. And then Saturday morning, it starts really early, probably 6.30 or 7, and it's over around noon. Um, the Grecia farmer's market is... It's huge. And there's organic booths. Um, there's somebody that sells homemade tortillas. There's coffee. There's a couple of little sodas or little like diner sort of restaurants. So it's, it's an outing. There's flowers uh, that you can buy, cut flowers. There's even like a little nursery area where you can buy trees. Um, you can buy bagels. You can, it, the Gracia Farmer's Market is really a lot of fun. Uh, Sarchi is Saturday mornings. It's a little bit smaller, but it also has um, some good baked goods places and organic um, stalls. Naranjo is Friday afternoon, starting around, I think it's 10 a.m. And then that's over by Friday, probably 7.30 or 8 p.m. And San Ramon is, I believe, Friday all day long. So and San Ramon also is quite big. A lot of choices in a, in a very limited area, right? So uh, you can definitely stock up. And I, I imagine the prices are really, really reasonable in those farmer's markets. 
Yeah, yeah. Most of the, especially because like the cold weather crops, like broccoli and things like that come from Zarzero, which is just, you know, half an hour from here. So yeah, lots of good fresh produce. Okay. I'll well, switch gears a little bit. You know, I noticed uh, your, your, your window's open and you're getting a nice little breeze. So I, I imagine, I imagine there's, you know, the cost of air conditioning, there's no air conditioning with that weather that you indicated. What, what is the typical utilities bill for, for a house in that 250 range that you spoke about? What's a typical utilities per month? It depends um, a lot on what sort of appliances you have, but if you have all electric, everything, stove, dryer, hot water heater, um, your electric is, that is the most expensive utility that we have. So it could be a hundred dollars a month. Um, in that situation, I have an electric stove, a gas dryer and a gas hot water heater. And my electric bill is $35 a month. Um, a lot of people have solar hot water. Uh, so it really depends on how many gas or solar, um, appliances you have. The water here is around $10 a month. Okay. And uh, internet varies a lot. We're starting to get a lot more packages where you can get like 100 megas with cable TV for $60 a month. Um, if you have to have private internet, which is the most expensive, you can get, um, I think right now I have private internet and I just got a flyer to change into Cable Tika. So I may do that because it looks pretty cheap, but I don't know how well it'll work. Right now I have a private company and I'm paying um, $60 a month and it's five megas, but it's different. It's not the same as cable, so it's pretty fast, and I can do Zoom meetings and things. <laughs> I think that I think you you provide us a very valuable information because these are the things when anybody moving down, these are the typical questions that we get. Is exactly that you know everybody's dependent now on internet, and uh, having a fast internet is almost uh, the new utility, right? It's the most important thing right now, really, <laughs> for electric. I think. Yeah, we wouldn't be communicating if we didn't have the <laughs> right internet. Huh? Yeah. Um, Let's talk about a little bit about health care. That's another thing that we get asked a lot about, you know, expats coming down and, okay, I'm going to move to Grecia. You're first going to find me a great home. I'm going to be living there. God forbid I have an accident. I need a hospital. Where do you go? What's available for health care in the area? Well, Grecia has a public hospital. Um, so whether or not you are insured, if something were to happen to you, you, you can go to the public hospital. Um, you don't have to be uh, affiliated with what we call the CAHA, which is the socialized um, insurance here. So that's number one. Even if you don't have insurance, you could go to the public hospital. Um, just I'm going to tell a story real quick about a client that I had. He fell. He broke his shoulder. He had just arrived. Um, he had two ambulance rides, um, several x-rays, pain shots. And he was in the hospital for about four hours and his bill was $200. So it's, it's a little different here if you have to go to a public hospital and you don't have insurance. Um, in Gracia, because we have the hospital, we have lots of uh, specialists and nearly all of them are bilingual. So we have an array of specialists that work in San Jose and then they come to Gracia two or three times uh, a week. So that's a big plus that you don't have to go into San Jose to see the, the specialists. Mm. Lots of walk-in um, clinics as well and private doctors. So if you were to go to a private doctor, your um, office visit would probably be about $100 and you wouldn't have to wait. I have a doctor who's bilingual who I can send um, messages to and take pictures of like if I hurt myself or something and he'll actually write me a prescription and send it uh, via the telephone and I can take it into a pharmacy and they'll give me the prescription. And he charges me uh, $70 for that. Yeah. I think, I think that's a very important point that you make. And, uh, and on the other side of your story, I've got a story on the other side because my, my son uh, visited uh, the United States. Luckily we had paid for the travel insurance. But while he was up there, he cut his finger and he needed like six stitches on his finger. Um, and we ended up getting a bill for almost $4,000 <laughs> oh from the emergency room. That, well, yeah. I handed it to the insurance company, but, you know, coming from Costa Rica, coming from Costa Rica, when I saw that, it was like, what? I mean, it's just, it's, a, it's yeah, one already. of the main reasons that we have so many clients, I think. <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. No, the fact that you point out, which is the, 
the proximity and the closeness that we have to our medical doctors here, the, the fact that they will even give you their, their cell phone number, their WhatsApp number, and it becomes very personal, makes mm-hmm. the, the medical treatment very, very different, very positive experience. Huh? Exactly. And of course, if you are in the Caja, then there's um, clinics in every little neighborhood. So if, you, if something were to happen, you know, the idea behind it is that you could actually walk there. Uh, that's why they're in the little neighborhoods. But um, again, that's really convenient. And, and that's a great point because we, sh- we should mention here that everybody who applies for residency and as part of the residency process, they will have to register into the social security system. So though all of, all of you who apply for residency are going to have access to this uh, public health care system. Um, things for like, um, you know, when expats move down, they're of course looking for activities. We don't want to just, you know, what... Of course, we're, we're with with COVID, so now a lot of things have changed as far as you know community and activity. But let's say pre-COVID, before COVID, what was the typical type of activity? How do I get involved in the community? How do I avoid from going insane by not doing anything? <laughs> uh, you know, not just retiring and sitting there doing nothing. How do I get involved in the community in Grecia, Naranjo, or, or you know, what is there to do? Um, well. Pre-COVID, of course, there were, you know, lunches and dinners. There still are in Gracia, they're doing Wednesday lunches for new people. Um, so that is actually still going on. But before there were three or four different groups that would get together, either Friday night dinner. And then I think there was like a Tuesday lunch at one point. Um, there was a group that would get together and play Mahjong. There's, there was a bridge group. Um, There were a group of guys that got together and played board games. Um, There's a group of women who knit and they uh, make little hats and and little um, blankets for newborn babies in the Gracia Hospital that they donate. Uh, There's a group called Blooms, and that consists of women in Atenas and Gracia. And I think there were like 60 members and they would get together once a month and have a potluck and they would generally have um, some sort of a theme or a charity or some uh, human uh, interest to discuss at, at each meeting. Um, you know, there's tons of opportunities to uh, socialize, sometimes more than what people actually want. There's, um, there's public swimming pools where I know quite a few of my clients. They go at like 10 o'clock in the morning and they exercise and they visit. There's hiking. Um, there's a lot of different things that you can do. You can volunteer with the animals. You can volunteer at the hospital. You can volunteer at the schools. There's a lot to do. Interesting. I think that's probably one of the pluses of being in the Central Valley that uh, you've got more population. So therefore, uh, you know, a lot more activities to, to participate in. Um, mm-hmm. So like if you were going to go to, your, to a local restaurant there in Grecia, what, what, what is like the best, you know, if anybody watching this decides, hey, I want to be in Grecia, I want to pick up a, a nice dinner or a nice lunch, where would they go to in Grecia that, that, that you find uh, is a great place to eat? Probably Tierra Nostra, which is a, uh, a, new, a new place in Grecia. It's, uh, it's, it's covered outdoor dining. There's a pretty view. Very good food. Very good food. There's a lovely Italian restaurant in downtown as well. Uh, well, there's actually three Italian restaurants um, downtown. And even if you just go to the Central Market, it's got a great soda for lunch. Oh, that's a great point. I forgot about that, that our, our Central Markets have great little restaurants inside and you get some really nice, typical Costa Rican foods for re- really inexpensive and really good quality. Huh? Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. All right, let's, let's switch gears a little bit and talk about uh, a little bit about uh, real estate in the sense of you know, we're getting reports from other real estate agents around the country that they're seeing an uptick in expats, you know, post-COVID. A lot of people interested in Costa Rica. Costa Rica seems to sell itself. Um, a lot of them, of course, are looking for beaches, but there are a lot that say, no, I prefer to be in the Central Valley, get my 70 to 80 degree weather, nice climate, and then I'll just go to the beach and come back whenever I want. So what, what are you seeing in your area as far as expats? Are they buying? What numbers are coming in? What, what's your overall perspective? We've had a ton of clients. Uh, I, I hoped that that would happen after last year, but um, the prices have been good because we're coming off of a year where no expats could come in. So there were 
um, less sales and also just the uncertainty of COVID. Many Costa Ricans didn't buy either. And uh, this year started off really good and continues to get better and better. Yeah, I have a closing tomorrow. I mean, I've had, I had a closing last week. I, it's, it's, it's busier than I've seen it in a long time. These things about um, going back to living here, for example, uh, mail service. So I live in Grecia. I forwarded my mail from the States or, you know, I'm going to get packages from Amazon, uh, mail service. What do you do? What do you do for your stateside mail? If you still get any, you know, uh, what, you know, how do people handle that? Um, well, you can get a P.O. box in downtown Gracia. It's, I think it's $30 a year, maybe 40 by now. So you can get your P.O. box. Um, if you live in town, they will deliver mail. Um, but I would never um, have anybody send anything bigger than a shoebox <laughs> because otherwise you may have to go to Sapote, which is in San Jose, the main um, Costa Rica post office, and pick it up. And that's, I've had to do that a couple of times. It's not very fun. So best to use manila envelopes if people are mailing you something. If uh, you order off of Amazon or something like that, then uh, I think Gracia has two or three of those services where they'll give you a Miami post office box and you can mail your things there and then uh, go pick them up in Gracia at the mail box services. One of them is Jetbox. Um, Adio Casillas, I think, is another one. And they'll charge you the customs and their fees, which are pretty minimal. They're really not very expensive. Uh, and you can you can order anything off of Amazon or anywhere. A great point you made with the customs because that's a big nightmare that people find out the hard way. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned it because we have people who, you know, their relatives in the U.S. will send them, you know, medicines or, or vitamins in a package and they don't realize that you know, in Costa Rica, everything that comes in gets stopped by customs. And if you don't have the right paperwork, the right import permits, they're gonna block it. So don't go through that it's trouble. A That's first. It's a nightmare. You don't even wanna to go to Zapote. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Huh? Um, kind of in, just in closing, I mean, what, what would you, from for you, you've got a lot of experience as a real estate agent in, in, in in the area and, and working in Costa Rica, what, what would you say are the biggest mistakes that people make when buying real estate based on your experience to help people avoid those mistakes? Mm -hmm. um, well, sometimes people, they think that they need a lot of land because they're coming from, I mean, in the United States, it's very normal for somebody to own several acres, you know, and you get on your riding lawnmower and, and you go out and, and you mow it or, you know, or woods and it doesn't need any maintenance, but we are in the jungle. So it's important to think about how much, you know, land do you want and why do you want it? Do you want it for privacy? Do you want it because you're going to grow things? Because especially I, I'm not sure if it's the same in the rest of Costa Rica, but in this, in this part of Costa Rica, the land is where the bulk of your money is spent when you do buy a property. So it's, and there are not even really any huge tracts of land available. I mean, five acres in Costa Rica and Gracia can easily cost you over $200,000 just for the land. So, you know, it's, it's getting too much land and then not being able to keep up with it, not being able to maintain it. You're paying a gardener quite a bit of money because it's jungle and it grows all year round it with the exception of maybe uh, March and April. So that, that can be um, a mistake that people can fall into. Make sure it's the climate you want. I mean, we got so many microclimates. You can find perfection for yourself and you should, you should look for it. You know, there's, there's places that are a little bit warmer, a little bit cooler, and we're talking. I mean, we're not talking more than 10 degrees difference, but at the same time, if perfection exists for you, then you should try to find it, right? Absolutely. We, we, always, we always tell people, look, look, at, look at the properties in the two seasons, right? Because it's so different. You know, look at it mm -hmm. in the rainy season and look at it in the dry season because it's night and day. The altitude makes all the difference. You know, Gracia, the downtown Gracia is at about um, 3,000 feet. And as high up as the houses go in Gracia, that about 5,000 feet. And there's a very big difference in the climate there. It, it's much rainier, foggier, and even uh, cooler the higher up you get. It's perfect. Yeah. I thought I wanted to be on the beach when I first came, but I'm really glad that, I mean, that would have been fun, but I know I would have ended up back here. You know, any of the considerations you see maybe that I've missed 
regarding uh, what expats should consider when, when looking at the Central Valley, when looking at Grecia and when, when engaging a real estate agent to help them to find property. Anything you wanna say in closing, falls all yours. Okay, well, um, you know, it is important to, to look around quite a bit. And, um, you know, I, I enjoy showing my clients um, different properties, maybe a little above, maybe a little below their price range as well, because I consider it part of the education. Um, that's really the way that you're going to feel comfortable about making a purchase is if you've got the education and you can see where the value is in the property. Um, and that is just by seeing as many properties as is realistic and that you can handle, really. It's important to look around quite a bit. And um, yeah, I would just say explore, explore, explore. Make sure that you find the right spot so that you're, that part of it is going to be as, as happy as you can be with your, the size of the town, the weather, and proximity to town. These are all things, you know, that you'll, you need to be thinking about when you're looking to purchase property. We appreciate your time. I think uh, the advice that you've given, the, the, the insights that you have for everybody is just super valuable um, because in a few minutes, uh, I'm sure you've saved people a lot of research time on, on researching. Different I hope so. I enjoy helping. I really do. It's fun. <laughs> really appreciate it. Th thank you so much, Brooke. Well, I hope you found the information about Grecia helpful, and I'm going to leave a link in the description to Brooke's contact info in case you want to contact her directly with more information. Um, as always, thank you for watching the video.